Afrobeats fans were not happy with Bujubantan after his recent comments on the Drink Champs podcast. The reggae dancer or legend's take on the genre sparked a heated debate online, with some fans feeling that he crossed the line. But was he misunderstood or did he actually hit a nerve? Let's dive into what he said and why it's got the Afrobeats community buzzing. Buckle up, this is the no BS version. First of all, what exactly did Bujubantan say? Let's start with this short clip. You said Afrobeats mm -hmm. gives, gives props back to, to, to reggae, to dance hall. Do they? <laughs> I don't heard you so. say that. I don't think they did. No, I never said that. I oh, said they don't oh, give oh, fucking props back to Dan Sal and Reggae. Oh, my bad. I heard it wrong. <laughs> and here's more of what he said. When you look at what's happening with Afro beats, their music isn't liberating Africa. It's full of superficial content. The music needs to free Africa, but instead it focuses on trivial matters. Reggae, on the other hand, remains predominant. It's the king's music, carrying the message of liberation and struggle. When you look at the struggles in places like Kenya and South Africa, which Afrobeat song can you relate to that provides peace of mind or speaks to overcoming the struggle? None of them. Tell me one Afrobeat song that can uplift us. Kenya is suffering. The, people of, the young men of Kenya are revolting. South Africa is on um, Sudan, South Sudan, you name it. But which one of these songs can I relate to for a peace of mind to tell me that I'm in the struggle and we are going to be better in the struggle and even though the struggle is hard, we're going to overcome. Tell me. You know what? So, I, I don't think I can. And I mean, that's pretty interesting. And honestly, it actually gets juicier. Buju Banton went on to say this as well. Reggae music, on the other hand, has a deep connection to soul and energy. It marks time in our lives, whether it's your first date, marriage or significant moment, reggae is there. Everyone wants to take from reggae, but they don't give us respect. They want to ostracize us while benefiting from our culture. The music is the, the bridge that's going to connect us. But what I was disappointed in, they didn't try to connect with Jamaica the roots. They connect with everyone else mm. except us. Uh, and, and you talking about Afrobeats? Yes. Okay, okay, continue. Sorry. So they're connected with everyone else except us. But when we look at what they're doing, their music is not free in Africa. It's far cry. And I think this following part that I'm going to read out is really where people were like, nah, bro, nah, this is not it. He said, Afrobeats, although rooted in Africa, is deeply influenced by reggae. Some Afrobeats artists might say their music has nothing to do with Jamaica, but our music has everything to do with Africa. We don't separate ourselves from Africa because the drum in our music speaks to our soul, just as it does in Afrobeats. The challenge for Afrobeats is not just getting people to listen, but having something meaningful to say. Music should inspire and awaken people, not push them backward. As Africa rises, our music must reflect that awakening, not remain uninspiring. Ace, Bujubantan, yo, yo, yo. He went in. He really went in. So let me analyze and break down the crux of the matter and what he said. In discussing what Bujubantan said and the current state of Afrobeats, it's important to clarify that the term Afrobeats isn't being used here to refer specifically to Nigerian music or a Nigerian music genre. Instead, Afrobeats has become an umbrella term that captures the wave of contemporary African music that has made significant inroads internationally over the last decade. So for many in the diaspora, when they hear the term Afrobeats, this term represents a collective African movement rather than music from one specific country. So we got that out of the way. Now, Buja Banton raises an important point about the state of contemporary music, particularly in the context of Afrobeats. However, the shift he observes isn't solely due to artists failing to create inspiring, conscious music. Several key factors are actually at play. First of all, the demands of the market significantly shape the music being produced. Musicians, especially those trying to make a living, more so in Africa, are often driven by what listeners want to hear. Today's audience tends to gravitate towards music that reflects aspirations of success, wealth and enjoyment, rather than messages of, you know, struggle and upliftment 
like it was in Buj Banton's day. Secondly, the music industry is far more competitive and saturated than uh, it was in previous decades. This saturation makes it difficult for music with deeper, more meaningful messages to really break through. While there's still music being made with strong messages, even by that upper echelon of artists like your Burner Boys, your Whiz Kids and so forth, it's often buried under the sheer volume of content that emphasizes more superficial themes. You know, the commercial charts aren't talking about, hey, liberate this country or whatever. That's just not where things are at. Thirdly, the new generation of listeners is different. They are well aware and educated about the challenges facing the continent. And that's a key distinction right there. Back in the day, I don't think it was the same level of education or consciousness about the happenings within the continent. But music was a great way to get those messages far and wide. So nowadays, they often turn to music as a form of escape. For many, music about partying, money and success provides a break from the harsh realities that they actually experience daily. This shift in listener preferences isn't unique to Afrobeats. It's a trend seen across various genres from raps focus to focus on materialism and then mumble rap to R&B's focus on like uh, physical pleasure and body positivity. And then you go to Amapiano's themes of partying and puzaring and all that stuff. That's drinking, by the way. Bujibantan's generation of musicians had a unique connection to their audience, speaking directly to the issues people faced at the time. Today, however, the world and its musical landscape has changed. What people want to hear has evolved and musicians naturally adapt to meet those desires. You find a lot of emo music, for example, that addresses things such as um, mental health uh, and is doing well on charts. Why? Because it speaks to the fabric of what the young listener and the most likely listener to that music is dealing with and what's important to them. In Bujubantan's day, people were looking for liberation from things like colonialism, so it was a different beast altogether. Despite this, it's important to acknowledge that Afrobeats and African musicians still produce music with uh, powerful messages, and these works might not always dominate the charts, but they exist and continue to resonate with those who seek them out. One person that highlighted this in response to the Bujubantan video on X was Gracie May with a list of Afrobeat songs that have strong socio-economic and political messages. And there's even a playlist of these songs. Look, I know it makes it sound like it's all fun and games in a way, but it can get really dark really quickly. Bobby Wine in Uganda, for example, who's a musician first, an activist and a politician that has spoken out against injustices in Uganda's system and everything, has been unjustly detained, tortured and badly injured. And that's just the surface stuff. On top of that, he's been denied health care and had to go like to the US just to seek the right medical treatment given his injuries. There are serious ramifications in many African countries for being too free with your speech. Worse yet, if you're someone with a platform like a musician, and a popular one at that, and this can go as far as death. Achalu Hondesa, a popular singer and ethnic Oromo activist in Ethiopia, was gunned down in 2020. And he was young too. He was born in 1986 and was only 34 at the time. So it may sound like it's an easy thing to do in Bujubantan's eyes, but the truth is African youth are facing systems of repression and they know what will happen if they speak out too loudly. And Bujubantan will not be there to protect them. So can you really blame Afrobeats artists for exercising caution in something they know could end their careers and possibly lives? And fam, I'm from Zim. We know exactly what it's like to suffer in silence because that's the only way we can guarantee to walk away with our lives. But I digress. In essence, the music we hear today is a reflection of where our society is. While Bujibantan's concerns are valid, the shift in music is indicative of 
broader changes in societal values and listener expectations. And you can't expect the leading musicians of today to disregard that, let alone African musicians. The world has changed and so too has the music that captures its spirit. Buju Banton's recognition of the deep connection between African music and Jamaican music is spot on. I do agree. There is a connection that has existed for a long time and it's crucial to acknowledge and celebrate it. To suggest otherwise is to overlook the rich history of musical exchange between the various cultures involved. Some people seem to resist acknowledging this connection, maybe in the fear that it diminishes Africa's musical achievements. However, this isn't the case at all. Recognizing these influences doesn't belittle Africa's strides in music, rather it highlights the global dialogue that music fosters, the connection that Buju Banton was talking about. The fact is, musical influences are pervasive and cross-cultural. For instance, some of the biggest Afrobeats hits over the past few years clearly draw from Zouk and Kizomba music, particularly in the drum patterns and all that, Jamaican dancehall as well. You know, it's all just adapted to different tempos and different instrumentation to have a certain feel, which is then identified as Afrobeats. Ama Piano, which has taken the world by storm, has its roots in house music, Kwaito and more recently incorporated elements of techno and EDM within it. These examples show that musical influences are a natural part of how genres evolve and adapt, even how genres come to be as fusions of two or three or four different things together. So the key question is this, did Buj Banton actually disrespect Afrobeats? I think he stated his position from his point of view, which I can respect, but I believe his stance didn't factor in the complexities of the realities on the ground for the modern day chart toppers and musical collective in Afrobeats and just the wider African music. The musical expectations won't be the same from generation to generation. And I believe Bujibantan was speaking to us as an elder to what he knows and understands to be true because of his extensive experience in the music industry. That doesn't mean he disrespected Afrobeats, but he definitely has a different perspective, which some Afrobeats fans and artists don't agree with. All in all, music is a universal language, and its evolution is shaped by a plethora of influences that cross borders and cultures. The connection between African and Jamaican music is a testament to this. And rather than diminishing one another or one or the other, it actually enriches both. Afrobeats as it stands today is a powerful example of how music can transcend boundaries and bring people together while honoring its diverse roots. And I hope this continues to be more of a discussion than attacks on each other because we don't need that let me know what you think in the comments below and let's have a healthy discussion around this otherwise that's it for me my name is mj omoto son of zimbabwe signing out peace day day oh you are the danger